Mindsetters, welcome to another live show on Mindset Learn Extra. Can you believe it? We're here for physical sciences, grade 10s. You're here with your girl Smithy, a.k.a. Megs, and one of our favorite, favorite science teachers, Auntie Tracy. <laughs> so, Tracy, how are you? Doing well, thanks, Megan. How are you? I'm fantastic. Please tell the Mindsetters what we're going to be doing today. Well, grade 10s, we're going to be looking at representing physical cha uh, chemical change, so writing formulae, balancing equations, an incredibly important section of work. And grade 11s and 12s, this is something that's very important for your revision, so that you can build uh, in terms of, of um, all the different chemical chemistry that you do. So it's the basis of where we it's start. It's the basis of me. a new language of chemistry. Exactly. So I'm going to send you to the board so I can tell them the rest of what to Thanks, do. Thanks, Megan. No problem. Okay, mindset is so, I hope you've noticed that on the web page, we have a fantastic, fantastic new competition called Future Stars. So if you are between the ages of 16 to 21, I urge you to go take a look at the page. It's mindset.co.za forward slash learn extra. And it's all about if you think what it takes and you think you are South Africa's next future star, I urge you to please go look on the page. But don't forget, on our page we have all the notes of these lessons, all the videos. And if you want to be like me and sit here with the notes so that we can learn more together, I promise you it helps so, so much. But don't forget, also on our Facebook page, yes, I will be sitting here posting comments for you, helping you out. So if you have any, any questions, it's facebook.com forward slash learn extra or hit me up on Twitter at learn extra. So great tens, I hope you're ready for our show. But before I give to Tracy, I just want to say hey to my little cousin Keegan. I hope you're watching and I love you to bits and pieces. So Tracy, please, please hit us up with how to represent chemical changes. Thank you so much, Megan. Well, great tens, as we said, we're going to do chemical change today and focus on representing chemical change. And I almost want to say it's, it's like learning a new language. This is going to be fundamental as you move forward in, in your studies of chemistry because we're representing change. And what we want to be able to write chemical um, formulae and write chemical equations. And so that scientists across the world can all be speaking the same language. We write symbols and, and work with these equations. So come to the board with me as we look through what we're going to be doing. So in this lesson, we're going to use symbols to represent chemical reactions. And you remember last time we spoke about physical and chemical change. And physical change was just with the particles rearranged. So if you think about water being heated from ice melting to a liquid, those particles which were s packed in a crystal in a solid um, lattice have now been able to move apart and are able to flow over one another. Right, that's physical change. The substance hasn't changed itself. Whereas with now chemical change, we're looking at new substances forming. So just on the side here next to chemical reactions, I'm going to write here new substance. Substances form. Okay, chemical reactions. So we want to write symbols for to represent these chemical reactions. We're also going to do a lot of practicing of writing formulae. So writing the formulae for potassium hydroxide or those types of things. Then another key concept is to balance equations. And you might have heard of balancing equations. Um, and, and people will say, oh, it's really, really hard. It's not. You just need to understand the concept. And then we also speak about state or phase symbols. So you might have a little thought there on solid, liquid, or gas, right? Or aqueous solutions. So let's get straight into it. Well, chemical reactions, what I want you to notice here is that this is when new substances are forming. Okay, so it's not a physical change. It is a new substance that is forming. And so what we focus on here is that we're going to make have a new substance in that is forming, we're going to start with reactants and those change into products. Okay, So reactants are the things at the start of the equation and they will be rep put on the left-hand side. Now, I want you to notice my shorthand here, LHS, left-hand side, and the products will be on the right hand side okay as we read from left to right so the reactants are the things that you've got at the start 
they will be the things that will react together, okay, in order to make the things at the end. This is what is formed or is produced in this chemical equation, right? So what you've got is you've got the reactants on the left going to the products on the right, okay? And it's very important that you are working with those words react or form so that you can, get, when you get a word equation, that you can interpret what they're starting with and what they're meaning you to get. So as we're forming this new substance, these new substances, reading from left to right, left-hand side reactants, right-hand side products. The next thought is that there are different ways to write equations, okay? Three different types of equations that you could get. Firstly, you could have a word equation. Then we could also go with a symbol equation. Equation. And lastly, we need to focus on writing a balanced keyword symbol equation. Sorry, let's just balanced. Symbol equation. And I'm going to start with the first two, and then we'll spend the last segment talking about writing a balanced equation. Okay? What most people struggle with is going from the words into writing symbols. The reason that they struggle with that is because they don't have a good understanding of the periodic table and chemical bonding, which is actually the basis of how we write things. So it's very important that grade 10s that you, and 11s and grade 12s that you go back and that you will recap some of the work we've done previously. Okay? It's incredibly helpful if you can go and revise that work because the chemical bonding section will certainly build on what you've done, what we're doing now. Okay? So I'm going to spend quite a bit of time writing symbol equations and specifically here, writing formulae. So let's go across to that section. One more thing before I move on from here um, is that you've seen us write reactants and products, and you've seen we've got in the middle here an arrow, also is from left to right, as we show um, the direction that the reaction is taking place in. It's important to note that actually some reactions are reversible. They go in both directions, okay? And so a reversible reaction can be forward and reverse. Reversible, okay? Some reactions take place in both directions. We are, for the, at this stage, going to focus only on forward reactions, but as you get to grade 11 and grade 12, we will do for, um, reversible reactions as well. So let's get it get plugged in in terms of writing chemical formulae, because I know this is the section that many people struggle with. Consider the group number. When you're working with these, the group number, and by group number, I'm thinking the group number in the periodic table, okay? If I go across to my periodic table in a moment here, there it is. These, sorry, these are your groups. So that's going to be group one. Here we have group two. These are the groups that we're talking about, okay? The vertical columns, right? Let's jump back to our notes here. The group number will help you to find the valency of each substance in the compound. So if you're writing something like potassium chloride, okay, go and look at potassium in the periodic table. What work out its valency. Go and look at chloride, chlorine, which would be what chloride would be, okay, in the periodic table. Go work out that would be, and then you can work out how these things work in terms of writing the formulae. So consider the group number to find the valency of each substance in the compound. And as I say there, go back and revise your notes on chemical bonding. For covalent compounds, now remember what a covalent compound is going to be? When a non-metal reacts with a 
another non-metal, okay? So those things on the far right-hand side or the right-hand side of the periodic table, that those would be non-metals when they react together. What you're going to have here is for covalent compounds, the valency is a helpful number because it represents the number of bonds the substance can make. For each substance, draw out the bonds as little arms and then link each of them. Now, I'll do one with you. I've chosen to work out ammonia, okay? Now, ammonia is made of nitrogen and hydrogen. Nitrogen on the periodic table, let's go and find it. There it is. Sorry, let's go and highlight it. It's in group 15. And I know it's also made of hydrogen, okay? So hydrogen's here in group 1. It's a non-metal, but because it's also only got one valence electron, it's linked in with the other ones with only one valence electron. So I'm jumping back, and I've got here nitrogen is in group 15. It can make only three bonds. Why is that? Well, because we know all these substances want to have a filled out energy level. Okay? So what you're going to want to happen is to get the same outer energy level structure as the, the noble gases. So this wants to have a filled out energy level. How many more does it need to get to 18? It's going to need three more, okay? So 18 minus the 15 is going to get me to three bonds. And I'll just put in there 18 minus 15 is going to get me equal to three bonds. Another way of working that out is to draw out the valence electrons. So I've got nitrogen. I'm doing a Lewis diagram here. One, two, three, four, five. Why? Because I know it's in group 15. It's going to have five valence electrons, okay? So nitrogen has five valence or outermost electrons. It then has a valency of three. Why? Well, because, look, it's got three unpaired electrons. It wants to pair up in those three places. Okay, now this is a simplified model, but hopefully it's going to help you. So when this thing bonds... Hydrogen, sorry, we haven't gone to hydrogen. Let's do hydrogen. It has one valence electron. How many bonds can it make? It can make only one bond. So let's draw hydrogen with its one little electron. And so hydrogen's going to be able to fit in. I need some more space here. Right? What we've got is that nitrogen with its one, two, three, four, five. And the hydrogens can come fit in one, two, three. There they are. The formula is going to be N with its three bonds and the hydrogen with its one, one, one. Those little arms linking up. And so I know that my formula is going to be N. H3, okay? So the idea here with covalent compounds, we use little arms to make the bond, to represent the little bonds, and you can link up how many bonds, okay? This is quite a useful technique. As you work on the number of valence electrons and, how m and the valency, how many bonds it can make. Megan, I'm going to hand over to you in a moment because I want us to take a short break. We've done covalent now. And then we're going to co come back after the break and work on our onic and writing formulae. Now, this is critical, critical, critical. So take a short break, and we'll see you in a moment. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Tracy. Okay, well, great tens. I hope you guys have at least took a little bit of consideration to what she said because it is very, very, very important. I stress you not. Believe me, last year, if you don't know what the terms valence electrons, valency means, you must come and watch the show. Tell your brother, sister, if they're in matric, to come watch because this stuff is very, very important. So quickly go have a glass of water or something, anything, and we'll be right back with you in a few moments.
Welcome back, grade 10s. Uh, we've gone through all, all of your questions that you had for us. So Tracy's going to now hit us with some of the questions that you hit me up with, and she'll explain exactly what she meant by each term that she was talking about. So I hope you guys had a good ad break. So let's take it away with our physics. Thanks, Megan. So um, I heard from Jamie, and I've heard from Kelvin. Listen up. Here's your question. So Jamie, you asked, where did we get 18 from? 18 is the group number that you can see at the end here that is indicated for the noble gases. So that is the total number of filled, um, the, the number for the of filled outer energy level. Okay? The idea is that a noble gas structure is the most stable when it's got the most filled outer energy level. Okay? Um, and very often we na call that number 8 as well because the old periodic tables didn't number these guys, the transition elements. Okay, so often as you'll see in some periodic tables call that group 8. We're now transferring across to call it group 18 for the noble gases. Jamie, I hope that answers your question. And then Kelvin asked about clarifying the idea of valence electrons. Oh, sorry. Let's just undo that. Valence electrons and valency. Okay, very, very important that you get the idea. The valence electrons are the ones that are in the outermost energy level, okay? So if the outermost energy level is level 3, it's all the ones in level 3, right? Whereas the valency is how many bonds the substance needs to make, right? And go back, we did quite a bit on this in chemical bonding. The valence electrons, how many there are in the outer ring, okay, or the outer energy level, valency, how many bonds the substance can make, right? So group one, group two, the valency and the valence electrons are the same, and group three, whereas when you start going towards, um, towards into the, the non-metals, the valency and the valence electrons are very different, right? So go back and revise those. If we go across now to our ionic compounds, the valency represents the charge on the iron, okay? Now, I want us to explain this quite significantly. If I am, if we've got a magnesium atom, and magnesium, let's go and find it, it is in group, sorry, oh, it's in group two over there, okay? That means it has two valence electrons. So I'm going to just draw them in as little crosses. There we have them, okay? If that substance becomes an iron, what, what does it mean? It becomes a charged particle. Those have been given away. And so magnesium is left behind without those valence electrons, and it's going to be left with an overall charge of 2 plus. Why? Because it's now short of two electrons, it's given them away, right? And electrons are negative. So overall it's left now, more positive. Metals will always have a positive charge as they have given away the valence electrons, the outermost electrons. Non-metals, so metals are going to be positive. Non-metals will gain electrons. So let's change our color here. Non-metals will gain. So what type of charge do you think they're going to have? If they're going to gain electrons, they're going to take up extra electrons and they're taking extra negatives on board, well, then they will form what type of ions? Well, surely negative. Let me write that out. Negative ions. This is done always in order to have a complete filled out energy level. The idea is that an, a metal, its quickest route to getting a filled out energy level is to go to the level below, okay? To give away electrons to go to a filled complete out energy level of the level underneath, okay? So they would rather give away one than gain an extra seven, or they'd rather give away two than gain an extra six, okay? It's the shortest route to a complete out energy level. Whereas non-metals will happily gain. They only need to gain one or to gain two or gain three electrons to get to that filled out energy level. So I've got a summary here 
of the different groups. I'm going to change this one hydrogen. Let's change it to sorry. Let's change it to sodium in a plus because it's. I want to focus on metals. Okay. Group one will form a one plus ion. Group two will always form a two plus ion. Group three will form, or actually this is group 13 now, sorry, will form a three plus ion. It's going to give away those. Then we go across to group 16. Okay, these are the non-metals. They've only got one or two more to take up to get to a filled out energy level. So group 16 to get to 18 only needs to take up two. So notice the charge is a negative charge by how much? By two. So it's got a negative two. Group 17, negative. One. Group 18, zero. It doesn't need to gain or lose. It's got the perfect filled out energy level. Okay? So when we think about writing chemical formulae, go back to the periodic table. It will tell you what the charge will be, and you just need to bring these things together and organize them to get to a neutral um, compound. So to write the formulae of ionic compounds, we need to balance, keyword here, the charges to make a neutral compound. Okay? So I've gone through a list of them because I know that people struggle with this. If you had magnesium oxide and you're asked to write the formula for magnesium oxide, Go back, you're working with magnesium. So Mg, what's it going to be? It's in group 2, Mg, 2 plus. Oxygen, it's going to be in group 16. What's it going to become? Oxygen, 2 minus. And so the formula then, notice it's a 2 plus and a 2 minus. They match up perfectly, and so the we only need one of each. So I've written there times 1, times 1. The formula is a simple MgO, magnesium oxide. Okay. Now, let's do some slightly harder ones. Potassium. If I've got potassium oxide, well, potassium, go and find it. Where is it on the periodic table? I'm just going to clear all these little scribbles that I've got. Okay, so we can see quite clearly. Potassium is down here. It is in group 1. So what type of ion would it form? It would form a positive ion by positive 1. It's going to give away that one valence electron. Oxygen over here is in group 16. So it's going to become a negative ion. It's a non-metal. It's going to gain two electrons to get to that filled out energy level. So if we go back to our notes, we have here potassium as a 1 plus, oxide as a O2 minus. And the focus that I need you to, to notice here is I want the final formula to be neutral. Okay? So I have got one positive and two negatives. So I've got two negatives there. What about this one, I'm going to have to times the potassium by 2. We have to have two potassiums so that we can have an overall 2 plus and 2 minus is going to equal to 0. And when I write my final formula, notice I don't have any of the charges shown there because I'm showing that they are now balanced. I've written an, a, a chemical formula that is neutral. Okay. Let's do a few more. Calcium. Calcium is in group 2. Let's check it. Calcium, there it is, in group 2. And chlorine is here in group 17. So if I go across here, calcium, sorry, calcium, I know it's a 2 plus. The chloride is going to be a 1 minus because it's from group 17. How many chlorines do I need? I have to have two of them because notice I've got a 2 plus charge. Overall 2 plus charge, I must have a minus 2. So how am I going to get that? Well, I have to times the chlorine, that whole thing, 
by 2. And so I haven't, I've made a mistake here in my formula. Let's just cross that out and write it again. Calcium chloride would be calcium. I only need one of them. Chlorine, Cl, 2. Okay, the idea that we have to have two chlorines for every calcium. Now, this can be very challenging. Work back from, your peri from the periodic table, look at the group, write down the charge, and then work with it. Let's go across to some more hints on this. Write in chemical formulae. Now, you will have noticed that for all of those, we've just had group number, work with group number, and you sorted. There are also transition elements that, we c that have multiple what we call oxidation states. They can form multiple charges. So we will have to tell you which one, <laughs> which charge the substance is going to have. And so Roman numerals do that for you. The Roman numeral behind the name of an element in a compound will indicate the charge on that element. So I've given you an example here of iron 3 oxide, okay? It tells me immediately, I feel like I need some more space, we've got the, sorry, jumping, iron, the Roman numerals, those three little lines, those are Roman numerals. They tell you that the charge on the iron, the Fe, is going to be 3, okay? Is it going to be positive or is it going to be negative? Think about it. It's going to be positive. Why? Because this is a metal. So it's going to give away valence electrons. So here I have Fe3+. The oxide from there, I know oxygen, group 16. I know it's going to be a 2-. minus. Now, I'm going to jump down because I feel like we need some more space to write this. Okay. And so I'm going to write those again. Fe3+. Plus and oxygen, 2 minus, okay? Now, my question to you is, how are you going to get this thing to be neutral? Okay, we want it to be neutral. How are you going to get it to be neutral? You've got plus 3 and minus 2. The best bet is to look for, like you do in maths, a lowest common denominator or whatever, a lowest common multiple. What is the lowest common multiple between these? Well, 3 and 2, the lowest common one I can see is 6. And so I'm going to write there plus 6 and minus 6. Because what I'm trying to get to is to say how I want this to be giving me a plus 6 and then I can get a minus 6. What do I need to multiply 3 by to get to plus 6? I need to multiply by 2. What do I need to multiply the 2 by to get to negative 6? I need to multiply that by 3. The object here is to get these things to be electrically neutral, okay? to have no overall charge. So very helpful. Just by the way, a quick hint to you, you can also do a little bit of a cross multiplication does work, watch out though that you have an understanding of why it works. The idea is that you're wanting to get to this lowest common multiple. Okay? So, that's solving that problem. I specifically wanted to point out to you this idea of the Roman numerals. Because you can also get things like Fe2, um, Fe2, uh, so iron 2 oxide, okay, and iron 1 oxide, things like that. So just watch out. The Roman numerals tell you the charge, and you can immediately work with the charge. Let's go across to the board and notice that there are some important what we call polyatomic ions. Now, poly, polynomial, poly means many, okay, atomic atoms. Iron would be a charged particle. And I've written that down for you. There are some that are very helpful. We work with a lot. And I thought, let me just write them down. So you've got them. You can reference them some more. They'll be very useful for you to know. These are ions 
which are called which are charged particles made up of many many poly atoms so polyatomic ions these we treat as a unit okay so if i speak about a sulfate i know so2 so4 2 minus it's a unit that i'm going to treat completely by itself um I want to suggest that you go and learn these. There are only seven of them that we use on a regular basis. I have included at the end of this and on the notes whole big chunks of tables that you can go and, and reference and work with. And I know Megan's put them up on the page. Yes. So it's quite helpful that, that you could go and reference these. But I want to suggest that these seven, that you just go and quickly learn them. And if you can memorize them, whenever you, they come, you come across them, it's going to be much quicker um, for you than instead of going to have to go and find them. So I've got them here for you. I've grouped them into one. This is plus one. That's minus one, minus two, minus three. So I've grouped them in this type of order just so to help you remember the charge on them. So ammonium is one we come often come across. Helpful to note, ammonia is NH3. That's something you might also remember. So ammonium is going to have something extra, and it's got an extra hydrogen, which gives it this plus one charge. Hydroxide, hydro, referring to hydrogen, oxide, referring to oxygen, OH minus. Nitrate, very useful one to note, um, NO3 minus. Carbonate, CO3, two minus. Sulfate, SO4, two minus phosphate, PO4, 3 minus. These would be very helpful for you to go and work with quite often because we do um, come across them significantly. Okay, Tracy, I think they, they're telling me like ad break now because it's just... I think that's <laughs> a little bit overwhelming. <laughs> I think they just Great tens, what we're going to do is we're going to come back from this ad break and we're going to go through quite a, quite a few questions because I'm sure you're out there saying, help, I don't feel I can do this. You can do this. So we're going to take a short break and when we come back, We'll work on practicing quite a few of these. Exactly. Thanks, Megan. And don't forget, you can download the notes mindsetters at www.mindset.co.za forward slash learn extra. Now go have an ad break. I'll see you afterwards. Okay. Welcome back, grade 10s. I hope you had a fantastic ad break. So I'm here just to remind you about all the things that are happening here at the Mindset Studios. So don't forget, there's a competition, a new competition called Future Stars. So if you think you have what it takes to be a future star, or you know of someone and you want to nominate someone, please, if you're between the ages of 16 and 21, Write your friend down. You can get all the details on the website, which is www.mindset.co.za forward slash learn extra with an X. And then please, please keep posting questions, comments, liking all of our things because I'm here on the page talking to all of you guys. Any questions you have because this is the fundamental stuff. It's facebook.com forward slash learn extra. And if you don't want to do that, you can hit me up on Twitter at Learn Extra is our Twitter handle. So let me give it back to Tracy so she can just finish off all of this information so we can learn together, guys. Let's go. Thanks so much, Megan. So great, tens. We're going to go straight into some questions, and I've got a whole bunch of, of questions here for you um, on writing the formulae. So write formulae for the following. Magnesium iodide. Okay. Well, magnesium is going to be in group two. So it's going to be a 2 plus. Iodide, jumping back, here it is, iodine, sorry, let's find a different color, there it is, iodine, it's in group 17, so it's going to be I, what charge, positive or negative? A negative charge, by how much? By 1, okay? Now we have to look at it, we want to balance the charges, okay? So we want to have two iodides for every one magnesium. So notice here, my final formula is going to be MgI2, okay? The, uh, the focus point is that you want the charges to balance. So I have to have, sorry, I have to have two of those for every one of those, okay? 
Notice in my final, um, in my final formula, no charges are shown because I've already got a neutral compound. I don't need to show the charges. So the next one, zinc two fluoride. So zinc two, they tell me it's Zn two plus. The Roman numeral indicates what the charge is going to be. Fluoride, F minus. Why? Because it's in group 17. There it is. In group 17, I think I'm running out of colors, so we'll just go with that. And in the same way, we've got Zn plus 2 plus. I need 2 fluorine. Um, fluorides, sorry, there. Then copper sulfate. Now, copper is an interesting one. Copper is very often 2 plus. Sorry, let's just undo that. Copper, 2 plus. Sulfate. This is one of the ones I suggested you go and learn, okay, because we're going to come across them often. So I know it's on your page. You're going to go check me. It's SO4, 2 minus. If we want to just go back and check, there we had it. Sulfate, SO4, 2 minus, okay? So, as I write the final formula, notice it's a 2 plus and a 2 minus. The charges cancel or balance out. So, my final formula, SO4, I'm going to just rewrite that because it was a little messy. So, SO4, perfect. Potassium chloride, well, potassium is in group 1, so K plus. And chloride, we've had this already. Potassium, there it is, group 1. Chloride, Cl, group 17. And so chloride will be, using my pen, Cl minus. We've got a nice quick one-to-one -one ratio there. So KCl. Let's get to a few harder ones. Sodium nitrate. Sodium, do you see how this, this can go quite quickly? Let's work with sodium. I'm finding it there. It's in group one. And it's going to have an Na plus charge. Nitrate. This is one of the polyatomic ones that I suggest you go and learn because you'll come across them often. Nitrate will be NO3 minus. Now notice the charges are there, they cancel, plus one and minus one. So my final formula would just be NaNO3. Now I come to ammonium carbonate. So ammonium, NH4 plus. Carbonate, I want to just go back and show you on the, on the polyatomic ions. Ammonium was NH4 plus, carbonate CO3, 2 minus. So we can go write them down. Notice I often just write them down in terms of indicating my working, CO3, 2 minus. Just to work with the ions first. Then once you've got the ions written down, you can go in terms of writing them as a, a one final formula, balancing them. The question is how are we going to get to this to balance? Because here I've got a 1 plus and there I've got a 2 minus. Well, we need to have two of the positives. Would you agree with that? Would it be okay for me just to write NH42 and work with the rest of it? Hopefully you're going to say, no, no, Tracy, that's going to be terrible. That looks like 1 nitrogen and 42 hydrogens. That's terrible. Of course not. No, we can't write it like that because it would indicate the two next to the hydrogen, which is not what I want, okay? I want two of the whole thing, right? So what you need to notice is that we can use brackets to work with this and treat it as a unit, okay? So if ever you've got multiples of polyatomic ions, treat them as a unit, put them in brackets, and work with the multiples. So my final answer here is going to be NH4 in brackets, 
then two of those, because that's going to give me the two positives, and the carbonate CO3. The last one, calcium hydroxide, I've got calcium is in group 2 plus, hydroxide OH minus. Do you see how it's quick and easy if you go and learn those? And when I write my final formula, I need to have two of the hydroxides. So calcium, open brackets, OH, close brackets, two. Again, I don't want to write it, so this is not, as calcium OH, two, because that just indicates the two on the hydrogen on, and not on the oxygen. So that is not true. Follow with me? Brackets, enclosing it, helps to indicate that we are having multiples of that unit. Now I want us to move on and work on writing chemical, not only writing chemical formulae, but balancing equations. And I'm going to work quite quickly through this because I want us to get to some practice. The idea is we spoke last week about conservation of mass and the idea that the number of atoms on the, on the left-hand side must be the same as the number of atoms on the right-hand side because stuff doesn't just disappear. Okay? So you can go and work through those notes. I've given them quite, quite thoroughly to you. Um, but I want just to highlight here, in a chemical reaction, the total atomic mass of the reactants must be the same as the total atomic mass of the products. This also means that the total number of atoms in the reactants must be the same as the total number of atoms and the product at the end. Okay? Stuff doesn't just disappear. So let's go with this example. Hydrogen and oxygen react explosively to form water. Okay? Write a balanced chemical equation for this reaction. So notice I've just laid this out step by step. We've said let's do it in words first. Hydrogen and oxygen together make water. In symbols, I've written hydrogen. Notice here, this is diatomic, which means H2, two atoms together. Hydrogen exists as a diatomic. There are some others that also are diatomic. Nitrogen, oxygen, and we've had hydrogen. Fluorine, chlorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, all the, ha the halogens as well. So notice when you write a symbol equation, you have to, have to, have to show the correct symbol formula. And water, H2O. Notice I've said here it's not balanced. And I thought we could play a quick game. And I've got a, a page here. Let's go across to water. And this is actually showing separating water the reverse of what the equation I have on the board. So if I start with one water, there it is, two hydrogens and an oxygen, and I go to one there, and let's make one here. Is this thing balanced? Well, have a look. My balancing scales for hydrogen say two is to two, and that's equal. The oxygen, I've got one going to two. Well, that can't happen. One thing can't suddenly become two. So what must I do? Well, I obviously have to have two oxygens at the start. So let's increase that number to two. And there I now have oxygen that's balanced on the left and on the right. But hydrogen, oh no, the hydrogen's thrown out. It's got four and two. So what can I do? I can change this hydrogen there and make that two. And now notice that we are big smiley face because balanced left-hand side and right-hand side. The idea is simply that you're going to be counting the number of hydrogens and oxygens on the left-hand side with the reactants and on the right-hand side of the products. Okay? And you've got to make sure that they are equal because stuff can't be created or destroyed. Okay? So matter cannot be created or destroyed. Those atoms that were there at the start must be there at the end. So let's go back to our equation that we had and make sure we can balance it. I've said here, for a balanced chemical reaction, the number of atoms, the number of atoms of each element in the reaction is the same as the number of atoms of each element in the product. So it must be there at the start, it must be there at the end. In order to the balance an equation, we put coefficients in the front of the reactants and products until the number of atoms of each 
is the same on both sides of the equation. Note, you may not change any subscripts, NB, NB, as that would change the identity of the substance you're working with. So let's go and work on this equation. I'm going to jump down to the bottom because I'd like some more space, and I'll write it out again. We had hydrogen plus oxygen formed water. Okay? I'm noticing that I've got two oxygens here, but only one oxygen there. Would it be okay for me to say, well, I'll just throw another two in there? No, of course not. Why? Is that, wa is that oxygen? Is that water? H2O2? No, it's not. That stuff is actually hydrogen peroxide. Highly toxic. Very, very dangerous. Okay? Not the same thing as water. So no, you can't just go and simply plug in a little subscript here and there because maybe it will work if I do that. No, you can't. Once you have the equation in symbol form, you've got the right formula for every substance. You then have to leave it and just work with multiples of everything. Okay? So I'm going to take that away. Okay? Go back to what we've got. We need to have multiples of these things. So I notice I've got two oxygens there. So I'm writing a little table on this side. Oxygen, I know I've got two, but I only have one this side. So I'm going to put a two in front of the H2O. Okay? So that's now oxygen is sorted, happy, tick. Hydrogen, I've got two this side for hydrogen. And now I've got two multiplied by the two. So I've got four on the products. What am I going to have to do? I'm going to have to come across here and say let's multiply that by two, which is going to give me four. So I multiply in the front there, and I've changed the coefficients at the front, which is telling me how many I have. Okay? We are balancing an overall chemical reaction. Let's go across to do one or two more. I had this equation at the start. I actually didn't do this one with you. But let's go through this one together. Magnesium and oxygen for magnesium oxide. So Mg plus O2 forms MgO. That's the formula for magnesium oxide. Magne Mg, I'm going to have to put, well, let's start with oxygen. I've got oxygen 2 there, but only 1 on this side. So a big 2 in the front. Now I've got two magnesiums. I must go back and put a 2 in the front of the magnesium. Okay, that is all that is to balancing. I've given you quite a few hard questions to work on, and you can certainly look at those. Um, the last point I'd like to make is to talk about the state of compounds. Very often in equations, they give you these little symbols, G standing for gas, liquid, solid, and aqueous would be aqueous solutions. Very often those little symbols are indicated to you to help you um, as you work with, with these chemical formulae. So grade 10s, I really hope that's helped you as you discuss um, chemical formulae and be able to write chemical formulae brilliantly and balance equations. Thank you so much for joining me. I'll see you next week. Megan, over to you. Thank you so much, Tracy. It was a riveting lesson. And I hope no matter if you're in grade 10, 11 or 12, I promise. So let me just go to some questions quickly before you guys jump me with saying why. Do, okay. Um, they all want to know where they can download the application. Oh, the FET applica application. Yeah. Mm. It's, on the, um, it's on the link um, page right at the bottom of the note. Is it on the web page? It's on, it's on so it'll be on the website. Okay. It's a FET simulation, or you could just Google FET simulation, balance and chemical equations. It's there for you. Okay, cool. Well, that's... It's a great one to work with, grade 10s. It's really fun, and it comes with a little happy smiley face, and if you've got the sound on, it makes sound for you too. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much, Tracy. I really, like, I learned so much in this lesson. It's ridiculous. And I know, I know you guys did, because you're giving me so many formulas here, and I don't even know what's going on. But it's cool. So I hope you guys enjoyed today's show. I did enjoy today's show. And no matter, like I said, 10, 11, or 12, it's always, always best to go back to basics. So I just want to thank you guys for being here with me. And if you want to stay tuned for like the next few minutes show that's starting in a few seconds, we'll be here. So thank you so much.
that's all from me.